Welcome to OzCast, the platform where we take a deep dive into the science and research behind the issues impacting Australian waterways. Each week, we team up with experts in their field to take a look below the surface. Mark, welcome to OzCast. Pleasure to have you along. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it's an exciting time, a time where we can sit down and chat about uh, all things uh, freshwater fish, um, some of the conservation efforts that are going in there. Um, but I'm really excited about this episode because I was reading an article and the publisher described you as the man with the white flowing beard um, <laughs> who was concerned that there are species being forgotten in the conservation story. I think that's the sentence they put together. And I must have... I must admit when I read that, I went, that's a pretty good way to be described just quietly. So we're going to dive in today the weird and wonderful world of, of what you've been doing in your 40 plus year career, um, hopefully touch on a few species. Uh, but firstly, what brings you to the town of Dubbo? Oh, so I'm here for the Murray-Darling Basin Native Fish Forum, which yeah. is a gathering of people to talk about all things fish, basically. And you're launching a... You, you, the release of your book, that's right? Yeah, so this is the uh, updated second edition of Fishes of the Murray-Darling Basin. So it's everything you wanted to know and probably more than you wanted to know about fish. So you wrote the first edition um, how many years ago now? Yeah, that was published in uh, 2007 and it was distributed sort of freely through the basin and uh, 35,000 copies later it was time to wow. uh, to do a new one. But it's taken a little longer than I thought, but yep. that's life. So what, before we dive into anything beyond that, what goes into writing a... You know, a book of which is basically considered of you know is it is it somewhat of an an encyclopedia of species within that within the system or well, it's the only uh, a book on fishes of the Murray Darling Basin, right. and that's where you know Murray Darling Basin is Australia's food bowl. Yeah, lots of stresses on it, but a lot of people want to fish. Everyone yep. wants to catch a cod or a yellow belly or a catfish or something like that. Yeah. But it's not just the big fish, which is what everyone focuses on. It's uh, all the little fish as well, which everyone forgets about. Yeah, right. So it runs through everything there is to know about. Every it. So fish that's in the basin. How do you go about actually formulating a book like that? Like, run us, just give us a bit of insight into the world of a publisher on a book like that. <laughs> well, I'm not a publisher. I'm an author. Oh, an but, author, yeah. But I, I started, you know, when I wrote this back, uh, in the early 2000s, it, it started out as just a couple of two-page fish facts on each species. And as I slowly ground my way through them, you know, you talk to all the experts, you read all the literature, you try and, um, you know, speak to anglers, what are they hunting, things yep. like that, and you just slowly amass um, a group of facts and interesting stories sort of thing. And uh, then I put it together with a front end about what all the threats to mm. fish are and what we can do to help them. And uh, also, oh, it actually started with a bit of an overview on you know the issues that the fish you're about to read about are facing too. That's exactly right. Because if you don't understand the threats, you can't solve the threats. You mm. know, so people have no idea that some of the things that are threatening native fish in the basin um, are actually threats. So a whole lot of people don't realise that redfin perch are not a native species. So mm. some people don't realise that carp aren't a native species. Mm. And so you've got to get that basic education and, and get everyone up to the level playing field before you can start to solve some of these problems. So in 2007, when you were writing, is that right? When you yep. were writing this, what were back then considered the major threats? So I'm the reason I ask is I'm interested to then compare that to 2023, right? Which is, yep. you know, so back then in that front page, and I, I could be drawing, pulling too much from your memory here, but... What were you writing about back then as the major threats and has any of them been solved now? Or uh, So some of them have lessened. The major threats have stayed the same and, and then there's been a couple of new ones added. So the major threats to freshwater fish are loss of habitat. Yeah, So and you were writing about that still back then. Writing about that, yeah, you know, yeah. de-snagging of rivers, straightening of rivers, clearing of the vegetation on the side of rivers called the riparian vegetation. Over-exploitation, people catching too many fish, mm -hmm. treating it as a meat harvesting exercise rather than as a recreation. Um, flow changes, you know, dams have changed flows. They've changed the temperatures of rivers. Um, alien species, so things like carp, redfin, gambusia, trout, goldfish, all those things impact on native species. Um, those are sort of the major yep. threats uh, that occur in streams uh, and have done for the last 50 or 60 years, really. And so between 2007 and 2023, have you seen much progress in those five that you've mentioned there 
Is, or is are we basically at the same position that you no, were writing about back then? We're certainly not at the same position. There's been huge um, um, efforts to uh, deal with some of the easier to solve threats, I would say. So people are putting snags back in rivers. People are replanting vegetation mm-hmm. along the banks. And that vegetation provides shade, which cools water temperatures. It provides food supplies. So a whole lot of fish feed on insects that drop onto the water surface, okay? Yeah. So you take away that riparian vegetation and that food source is gone. We've had uh, a whole lot of um, efforts to improve fish passage. So. Rivers are salamied up into small sections by road crossings, weirs, dams, things like that. So there's now a, a, an industry around providing fishways to get fish past those barriers. Some things we haven't dealt with well at all, and that's because they're the big, gnarly, expensive problems. Like what? Well, the biggest one, I would say, is thermal pollution. Yep. And so when you build a sogging big dam on a river, and in the old days... They used to put the outlet, so where they drew the water from, down low, okay? So you can suck the most water you can out of the dam. Problem is, if you've ever swum in a farm dam, you know, your bloody, your shoulders are nice and warm and your toes are freezing because that's thermal stratification. So it's cold water down below. Cold water doesn't have much oxygen in it. And so when you release cold water down a river, it's deoxygenated. That's not good. It's also a bit of a passion killer for fishes. You know, if you're feeling frisky, the last thing you want to be doing is jumping into a cold shower, right? Because <laughs> fish use water temperature as their cue to breed. They use water temperature and day length. So they breed roughly at the same time of the year every year. And so if you're releasing cold water from a dam, it can go... 300, 400, 500 kilometres down a river. And so that means that that water temperature doesn't allow fish to breed. And so that's a major issue. Now, curing that is a big problem. So you put in multi-level offtake so you can take water from nearer the surface of the dam. You use bubble plumes, is it? You can use bubble plumes. They're they're not all that effective. You can use siphons and things Mm. like that. But um, water authorities are not that keen on using all of the... Uh, multi-level offtakes. They like to take water not from the surface because that has more bacteria and things like that in it. So if the water's going for domestic water supply, they want the cleanest water they can get. Yep. So there's still some big uh, structural issues around that. They, they put in a big uh, thermal curtain at one of the dams to try and, and improve water quality and that has failed multiple times. So we're still learning how to do with that. And these things are multi-million dollar exercises, whereas throwing a few snags in the river or planting some trees on the side of the bank are much lower cost. If you were to look at the course of our history as a a country, Australia, relatively young kind of history compared to some of our neighbouring countries like Cambodia and things like that that have, you know, been dealing with their rivers and waters, you know, supply and, and, and their and the life within for thousands and thousands of years. We're really only 200 years in, really, 250 years in. Would you say that the last 20 or 30 years has has really seen an increase in us trying to fix some of those problems? Oh, absolutely. Massively. Yeah. So in, uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin in particular, in uh, 2003, we started a thing called the Native Fish Strategy, and that recognised a whole lot of these threats and identified a whole lot of what were called driving actions that we needed to take to address these threats. So we had 10 years of that and then politics intervened, the native fish strategy ended. Then we were in the wilderness for a while and then all the things like the Menindee fish kills occurred in 2018-19 and that refocused attention again and we started to work again. People get really upset that... uh, the native fish populations in the Murray-Darling Basin haven't recovered yet, okay? And and the estimate in 2002 was that fish populations were at about 10% of their pre-European levels. And so everyone thinks, well, we've been whack- working on it for 20 years, we must have solved the problem by now. Well, it took 60 years or more for the fish populations to decline. It's going to take the same amount of time to recover them, okay? And so people are looking for quick fixes and there are no quick fixes, and there's certainly not enough money being devoted to it. So when you come back to the book, you, you decided to pick it up, I think it was in 2015, you started yep. to rewriting. No, nine years later, um, we're, we're sitting here now, obviously, at the launch. I think you launched it here, didn't you? Or the I'll re- launch it tomorrow morning. Tomorrow That's morning, right. there yeah. you go. Well, we, we jumped the gun. But I guess 
the point to take from that is that nine years, you know, nine years is a long time. Was that a matter of, you know, really spending that time writing it or were you busy doing other things? Um, and and I'm, I'm more keen to hear about in what installment two, let's call it, um, in that first opening paragraph, are you writing about anything different now, you know, particularly around what issues we're facing and how we're dealing with it? Is it more of an optimistic kind of tone to that first paragraph than it might have been 15, 20 years ago? Uh, I, think the, I think the tone is much the same. We still are facing the same problems mm. um, and some of them are getting worse, some of them are getting better, and it's really about stay the course. Yep, you know? okay. it's, this is a long-term mm. process and we've just got to keep doing it, basically. Are you optimistic about it? Are you, can, we, can we reverse some of those major issues that we've we've caused uh, is where do you sit if i were to say you optimistic about the health of the the murray darling system what would you say to that i'm uh, yeah i'm optimistic i'm also a realist i yeah. mean we're not going to solve it quickly um but it, unless you have a, a red hot go at it for a prolonged period of time you're not going to get there there yeah. are no quick fixes I think we can turn around fish in the Murray-Darling Basin, but I don't think we can turn it around with the amount of resources that is being devoted to it now, okay? Yeah, yeah. And so, if you know, you'd, there's a big thing going on about buying submarines at the moment, right? And that's $365 billion over the next 30 years. And somebody broke that down in a media article that I read the other day. And so that is $32 million a day, every day, for the next 32 years. Wow. Right? Now, the current native fish strategy's got $5 million over three or four years. Mm-hmm. And so you just realise that we are nowhere near putting the amount of resources in that we need to put in. That's not to say stop. That's not to say that it's too hard, but we've got to be realistic about this. You know, it costs $20 million to put a bloody road overpass on a highway or something. So mm-hmm. let's get real and value our fish and put some resources into it. Yeah, wow, that's interesting to break it down like that, um, particularly if you're to think what you could do with, you know, the amount of snags you could get back in oh. with, with that with that money, the amount of, um, I guess, you know, um, barriers we could either take down or redesign or re-engineer so they, they actually work. I mean, let's yeah. face it, some of them don't. Um, well, that, yeah, that's interesting. So what I want to get to is, you know, every every scientist, every fish ecologist, every researcher has a focus area right now. Yeah. And, and you know, everyone I've spoken to, they can speak about everything generally, but they've always got those few focus areas that they love to dive into. So um, I'm, I'm keen to hear about yours, particularly where you've spent the majority of time throughout your career, and then we'll pick a couple of them to, to dive into. So what are the big the big ticket items but for Mark. So the, so the big ticket items for me are threatened fish conservation, okay? And so, you know, if you're a koala or if you're a bilby or if you're an orange-bellied parrot, you know, everyone knows about the plight of those animals and the money flows to recover them. Fish are forgotten. They're, they're underwater. They're out of sight. People just don't pay any attention to them. You get the, the charismatic big... Oh, there goes the microphone. Goes you can pull that back in if you grab it. <laughs> there you go. Look at this. This is technology. There you work. go. You get, a... um, <laughs> you get the the big guys that sound level all right, all good. Yeah, the, no, that's the, fine. The, the big guys rolling. like Murray Cod, people are interested in because they go out and fish for them, okay? Yeah. If uh, you're talking about little things that are that long, then people don't even know they're there. And so that... That forgottenness flows through conservation of all freshwater fish in Australia. They're just, they're just not considered. And so my driving passion has been to raise awareness of uh, freshwater fish and, you know, why they're valuable and that we need to save them as well. Yeah, and it's, a, it's, it's not just small-bodied, it's, it's large-bodied, the whole, oh, whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, everything yeah. from, you know, Murray Cod down to, you mm. know, little bloody purple-spotted gudgeons or yeah. whatever. Yeah, know? very good. Well, that's... Let's pick one that I think um, is an interesting one. It's one of my favourite species, um, I think, to look at just quietly. I think they're beautiful, the trout cod. Yep. Um, so I know very little of – so uh, f- for those that are wondering where these kind of fit in, they are a larger, large-bodied um, uh, native species that is considered – is it threatened is the right word? I know, yeah, thre- I know. threatened is a general term and within mm-hmm. it there are categories. Categories, right. Yeah. So how bad are we talking for the trout cod? Uh, so trout cod are currently endangered yep. and have been since about 1994. And the interesting thing about trout cod is they were a species that was so misunderstood. So if you go back prior to 1972, there was only one freshwater cod species in Australia and that was Murray cod. 
And then trout cod was described as a separate species in 1972. And then since then, there's been another two described. So we now have four freshwater cod in Australia and they are all threatened. Okay. So was that a lack of, what, a lack of understanding, a lack of research? Prior yeah. to 72 or? So, you know, a fish is a fish to a whole lot of yeah. people's eyes. And so you don't understand the subtle differences. And then, you know, people had talked about trout cod in the past. And uh, they're actually one of the, uh, the first um, uh, Murray cod ever described was a trout cod. Okay. And so they got it wrong. And so the scientific names had to switch. But it's just people becoming aware that these things occurred in different habitats. They looked different. And so, you know, Murray cod are sort of that yellow-green mottled mm. colour and trout cod are this bluey-grey speckled colour, you know. Yeah, yeah, And people yeah. just say, oh, yeah, it's just they're a the variety. same fish. You know, red hair, blonde hair, doesn't really matter, you know, but they're actually different species. So before 1972, if you were to open, you know, maybe a book similar to what you're, you're writing or have written, it just says there is one cod. One cod species, Murray cod. That is, That's un it. That is unbelievable. Yeah. To think that at that point, which is not that long ago. I mean, no, it's 72. It's I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> and so, you know, you look at it and by the time trout cod were recognised, they were in trouble. Okay. By the time they were recognised as a separate species, they were in deep trouble. And so then we've been peddling as fast as we can to try and recover them. So where I come from uh, in, you know, around Canberra, um, there was a trout cod population. It was probably the at that stage there were maybe three or four left. Okay, and uh, it disappeared in 1976. So they were described in 72. By 76, we couldn't find another one in the Canberra area. Okay, same in uh, Victoria. They were in Lake Sample. They disappeared from there. They were in uh, um, you know, rivers uh, like the Lachlan, they disappeared from there in the 1970s, etc. And they, trout cod were a, a really great angling species and so they're a bit more aggressive than Murray cod. And so if you had the two cod species in one location and you flicked a lure out, trout cod had hit it first and yeah. they'd hit it hard, you know. And people love to fish for them. And back in those days, fish were a limitless resource. You know, there's millions of them in the water. Don't worry about it. So you just catch them hand over fist, you know, and that didn't do them any favours. Well, so before 72, if, if we didn't know they existed, then we they have just Murray cod. But, but we, we have no data on them. We have no understanding. Is that right? Like, can you retrospectively trace back the history of a species you, had, you, you didn't know was there? So you can. And so if you go through museum collections, people were pickling fish back from the 1800s, okay? Right. Um, luckily, uh, in a whole lot of areas, uh, people were still, you know, mad keen anglers and so they were taking photos of fishes back then. Now, they're black and white photos. But you can still tell But you can tell the, the, the pattern differences. And so there's a guy called Will Truman who dedicated his life to this um, in Victoria. And so he's gone back through... Um, landholders and anglers records, you know, for 100 years. And mm. you can see, oh, there used to be trout cod here, there used to be trout cod there, you know. You see a row of cod on a fence that have been caught by a group of fishermen and you go, well, that one's a trout cod, that one's a trout cod. Half of them are trout cod, you know. So you start to piece together this idea that back maybe in the 1900s, 100 years ago, what, 150 years ago, they were as prolific, if not more prolific, than, than the Murray cod. That's right. And so one of the things, by the time they were described in 1972, they only existed in a very small number of locations. And, and one of those was in a lowland river at Yarrawonga in the Murray, and the others were all in upland rivers. So there was this talk, oh, yeah, trout cod's the upland species and Murray cod is the lowland species. And there's that, that same pattern occurs with some other fish species, golden perch are the lowland species, Macquarie perch are the upland species, things like that. And I'm not sure whether that was actually true, and it's a bit hard to tease that out now, but what it did was it influenced how we tried to conserve the fish. So we thought, oh, yeah, upland small stream species. So when we finally got to captively breeding them, that's where we stocked them, in small upland streams. And that was probably the wrong thing to do, to be mm. brutally honest. Right. They didn't do very well. We, di we didn't stock enough of them, and we probably put them in streams that were too small. So in 72, when you found it, so someone's realised, okay, there's a different species here. We've got Murray, we've got trout, they've got different characteristics, more aggressive, yeah. looks slightly different. They're already, they're already in, in, a, in a bad state by that point. 72 to now, have they only got worse? And, and you know, was it, you said by 76, I think you said, 
Um, you couldn't find them in Canberra. That's right. So you, you might have only the glimpse that you got in '72 might have been the last, you know, the last remaining. Yeah. Um, and then now they're considered threatened. So I guess it, right now, are we in a point where we can save them, or are we ever, are we never getting back to where no. we were? No, no. Tri- well, you're never going to get back to where you were because rivers are totally changed. Okay, mm. you you cannot get back to what it was when you know white fellas first stepped foot on the country. But with trout cod, it's actually one of the success stories. So we've now been working on trout trout cod conservation since the mid-1990s. So we've been going at it for 30 years now. And I think they've actually improved in conservation status. So they're still listed as endangered, but... We, we did a, uh, a review about uh, three years ago and we reckon they're down to vulnerable, okay? And so that's... that's like so down vul- to... Yeah. yeah. Down, up, whatever. Yeah. They have improved to now right. only so be vulnerable. So vulnerable's better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there's vulnerable, then you have endangered, yep. then you have critically endangered, then you have extinct, yep. okay? Yep. We've had no freshwater fish known to become extinct in Australia. We probably lost some before we knew they were species, yep. okay? And to give you an idea of, of how this is going, it's currently estimated that we've only described two-thirds of our freshwater fish. So a third of our freshwater fish still don't have scientific names, okay? Do we know what they are? We just haven't mm, got that far? Well, so, some of them we sort of think we know what they are. The majority of them would be small-bodied, though, surely. Majority of those are small-bodied? That's exactly right. Because yeah. you'd be catching, we'd be catching the other ones. So, yes, but, and so, you know... Science is a, is a weird thing. And so people describe subspecies, which is sort of not quite a species, but on the way to getting there. And that sort of has gone out the door now. So mm-hmm. we are still describing new taxa all the time. Um, and most of them are small bodied species. Okay. Right. And so, uh, mate of mine, um, there's a thing in the Murray Darling Basin called the Mountain Galaxias. It's a widespread, common little fish, you know, yay long. And it was known to be highly variable in how it looked. It had different colour forms and all that sort of stuff. Well, it's been split from one species into 15 species. Of those 15 species, nine are now critically endangered. Okay. So, again, was it the same story where we thought it was just this one species? Thought it was just one like species, cod, yeah. And now like you've cod, found 15 different ways to... 15 and there's more being split out of it now. Okay. Wow. And so, you know, that it, it makes it problematic to conserve things because mm. you think you're doing the right thing and you haven't got the basic building blocks right yet. You know, you can't tell whether you're driving a bloody Cortina or a Tirana, okay? And so, you know, that's one of the issues that we have. Um, I'm conscious we'll come... We, we, I do want to talk more about yeah, this. Yeah, we'll I, I guess trout cod, eh? I, I guess we're... You know, I, I guess it's a great analogy that, you know, we, we're talking about a species that at one point wasn't even known and I find that so fascinating, which... But they still get caught, you know. Nowadays, I've got I've got friends that fish, you know, quite quite a lot in in the freshwater systems, and they often hold up a, they, you know, a trouty, you know, a trout cod. That's um, exactly right. And it, yeah, I'm interested to hear more about the issues. So because for them to go to to threatened, right? There's got to be, you know, there's got to be a reason why the Murray cod isn't gone too. So what was it about? What was it the characteristics about the trout cod that made it so vulnerable? They tend to occur in slightly faster water and slightly deeper water. And as I said, they're slightly more aggressive. So they probably got hammered harder by recreational fishing in the past. Um, nobody really knows why some species become threatened and others don't. You know, there must be something in the, in the makeup of that species that just makes it a little mm. softer is not the right word, but a little more susceptible to threats. But so with trout cod... You know, the, the major thing that has led to its partial recovery or its trajectory going up is that we can captive breed them. And so, you know, fish are wonderful things. You can, you can get um, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 eggs out of a trout cod. And so we can breed those in captivity and we can stock them and we can deal with some of the threats that have passed. So, for instance, you know, in the 1800s or early 1900s, there was commercial fisheries all through the Murray-Darling Basin. And so huge amounts of fish were going to the Melbourne fish market for food. Well, I know okay. the Melbourne one was huge. Um, That's it. You know, and and in, in a lot of the anecdotal 
kind of accounts that I've read, they, they describe it as a Murray cod fishery. But based off what you've said, there's a high chance the trout cod are in there too. It was you just know? cod. It was know? just I mean, cod. Because yeah. Murray cod was the only species. So it was, it was a cod fishery. Wow. It's the same with some of the perches. Macquarie perch were called Murray perch. Um, yep. uh, different names and nobody really knew what they were mm. eating. It was just food. It's it's free protein. Yep. You're going through the depression. People are doing hard times. You just want something to eat. Mm-hmm. And so they caught fish. And people caught fish in, in totally unsustainable ways that, you know, you go and you and you fish somewhere hard until you couldn't catch any more, whereas nowadays you wouldn't do that, you yep. know. You try and protect the resource. So trout caught have come back, you know, 30 years of conservation um, action, and they have been re-established in a number of rivers and a, a number of new populations. And we've learned how to do that better. I'm keen to hear a bit more about that. But just before we move on, so other than the commercial fishery side of it and then being a, an aggressive species, which might lead them to be more susceptible to overfishing and things like that, surely surely there's got to be you know another reason. Is, it, it, did anyone ever h- hypothesise around the fact that they like you know running water, you know, faster flowing water and that flows have slowed up a little bit is that is, is there anything to do with basically outside of human intervention that has caused their demise or is that basically the fact that we overfished the hell out of that system and well, they were gone so all, all of all of these things are human intervention so the the murray river is now a series of weir pools mm. okay it's a series of stairs and so things that like faster flowing or better flowing water, they've been really impacted by that. And so weir pools are not great environments for some species. Murray cod can live quite happily in the Murray cod can breed in farm dams and, mm-hmm. and lakes. Don't know whether trout cod can, mm-hmm. okay? And so it's just that difference in biology between the two cod species that means that one is more vulnerable to interference than the other. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's, 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 it's so... It's, it's nearly natural selection, really. Well, it is natural selection, yeah. And some people argue that things that are endangered should be left to go extinct, you mm. know, because they're not tough enough. Well, I don't think that's right. You don't agree with that? No. Well, you know, otherwise you just let everything go. And yep. so, you know, kiss koalas goodbye for yeah. a starter, okay? <laughs> and so you say that to people and they'd be up in arms, you yep. know. If a fish goes extinct, they're probably a little more relaxed about that. Yeah. But with trout cod, you know, we started uh, reintroducing populations into small creeks and we would put 400 fish in a stream, okay? And it's all of these reintroduction efforts are a numbers game. It's about how many fish you can put in and how long you can do it for. And so there was a big leap forward in Victoria. They reintroduced trout cod to the Ovens River and they stocked 40,000 fish a year or thereabouts for 10 consecutive years, right? A lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. And, and what it showed to us, when you, when you go back and you subsample, you know, you go and you monitor and you catch fish and you kill some to learn from what you're doing, and they can age fish. So fish have ear bones, otoliths, lay yep. down rings like a tree so you can age them. And so in that 10-year stocking program, it was only like three of those 10 years where the stockings did really well. And so what you've got to do is you've got to keep things going for a length of time so that you can hit the good years. You know, there might be a good year in the river. The flows are just Mm -hmm. right and the temperature's just right and you're in the Goldilocks zone. You know, everything is just right. And so your stocking takes. Um, If you only did it for two years and those two years were bad years then you're screwed, you Mm -hmm. know, you've missed out and you fail. And so it's the same with um, introduced species becoming established in Australia. It's all about how many times you tried it and eventually you succeed. And that was the case with, uh, they tried to introduce bloody rabbits in Canberra and they kept them in in cages in the ground and acclimatised them and then let them out of the cage and they'd run loose and they'd get eaten by quolls, okay? But they just kept doing it and eventually they succeeded. It's the it's the introduction of trout to Australia. They put the they put them they packed eggs in ice in moss from England, right? Put them on a sailing ship, put the pedal to the metal, and went flat out to get to Australia. Well, that took six months, right? By the time they got here, the ice had melted, all the eggs were dead. Bugger it! So they did it again. Same result. Bugger it! So they did it again, and finally, I think they got two boxes of eggs that survived. They went to Tasmania and that was the start of trout in Australia. It's about perseverance. It's about bloody-minded people that just want to keep going and fish conservation is the same. You need 
you need bloody-minded champions to just keep going, basically. Mm. There is so much to unpack there, Mark. I'm, you've opened a can of worms <laughs> that I, I don't know, but uh, it, it's brilliant. So I, just stick with the trout for a second. Do you know much more about the reason we brought them over here? Was it purely recreational? Oh, so the whole introduction of foxes, rabbits, anything like that to Australia was what was called the acclimatisation movement. And so Australia was settled by white fellows from Europe, okay? And so they wanted the animals around them that they knew from their homeland to make them feel more comfortable. They thought Australian fish were rubbish to fish for. They wanted something that would leap and fight and, you know, fly fishing and all that sort of stuff. And so, yeah, it was just trying to have animals around you that you were comfortable with and that's that's how most of the things came to this country so they were you know they, they were literally brought here so people could fish for them so people could fish for them you know i mean you know trout fishing you know back in europe it's it's the it's the squire's game yeah, you know yeah, it's not yeah. the poor people's game the yeah. poor people fish for carp mm -hmm. the squire fish for trout you go to england now you'll pay a thousand dollars a year to bloody fish on you know 500 meters a stream for yeah. salmon or something like that and wow. so that's just the way it is, you know. It's a class thing as well. So at what point did we realise that tr that trout, and I'm going to ask you point blank, how, how detrimental are trout to something like the stocky when we get there? The stocky galaxia. Excuse me, giving it nicknames already. Yeah. Um, but do, do we know anything about at what point we realised? Because at, the way I see it, carp and redfin, well, more so carp, they're really considered, everyone knows them. Oh, how bad they are, how detrimental they are, carp, stinking carp, muddy mud suckers, you know. Trout, a mm, bit more of a controversial one. People oh. like fishing for them. People like eating for them. But from what I'm aware, for small-bodied threatened species, which is something that you've spent a lot of time doing, trout are the number one thing that are really threatening them. Is that a fair statement? That is absolutely correct. So the, the, you've got to take... As soon as you know, some of the trout fishermen hear this uh, story, they're just going to go ballistic and say, oh, Linto's bloody trying to eliminate Linto's trout from got Australia. Him again. Yeah, yeah. Linto's in. No, well, I encourage you. But, Let's go. But it's not about that. And so I fish for trout. I quite enjoy fishing yeah. for trout. Trout have been in Australia for uh, 150 years now, okay? In some areas, they've done the damage that they're going to do, okay? And so you recognise the social and the recreational values of them, and you live with them. But in other areas, um, you want to try and remove them from little streams if you can, because these little small-bodied fish are now mainly confined to tiny little streams. So you can actually, you can have both worlds. You can have a trout fishery in the right spot. You can have uh, threatened small-bodied fish conservation in other spots. And it's Trying to strike that balance, which is really hard. You know, people are one-eyed fanatics. You know, Brumbies in the Alps. You know, some people reckon they are God's gift to everything. To me, they're just another introduced species that's causing damage to some of the things that I'm concerned about. But you try and have a balanced argument and you can't. People are polarised. You one know, or the other. It's one or the other. It's like footy clubs, you know. I barrack for Collingwood, yep. okay? They're the best footy club. Yep. I will not hear otherwise, mm -hmm. okay? Do not try and tell me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Et cetera. And so you get yep. those polarised opinions. I'm with you. you. Okay, yeah. so so the two the, the, you mentioned two things there. You mentioned trout and you mentioned brumbies. Yeah. From from my preliminary reading of some of the work you've done around stocky, stocky galaxias, they, they are two major threats. They are. Particularly around, you know, the, the what they're doing with their hooves and the – the damage they're doing to the edge, the, the riverbanks and the, the marshes and those zones where these small-bodied fish are inhabiting and then you've got trout which are just quite literally eating them, anything in front of them because they're so ferocious. And So, so let's, let's use that as a, a gateway to, to the stocky. Tell us a bit about it. Why? Firstly, what is it? But more importantly, why should we care about it? So stocky galaxias is one of those 15 new species of galaxids that came mm. out of the mountain galaxias before. It... Um, it was described from a single location in uh, Tantangara Creek in Kosciuszko National Park. It was described in 2014 and until 2020, that was the only population that we thought we had and I then found another one. So what, hap what happens with these little galaxids is that people think of them as this you know, tiny little stream specialist right at the top of mountains or whatever, and that's probably not correct. That's where they've been pushed by trout. And so trout and galaxias do not coexist together. You know, if, 
If you were a stocky Galaxius out in the stream, you would swim up to a trout and say, g'day, how are you? And the trout would just say, very tasty, boom, you know. So they have no anti-predator mechanisms because they were the only fish that occurred in their stream. And so now that, you know, all of these Galaxids in Tasmania, in, uh, in the high country of Victoria, in New South Wales, they've been pushed to the very top of their range. And that gives us a bit of a weird appreciation of what they, where they should be. And it's not correct. They probably would have been at much lower elevations and much more widespread, but that's where trout were. And the only reasons that stocky Galaxias still exist is that they are in a, in, they're in two streams above large waterfalls and the trout can't get up the waterfall. It's as simple as that, okay? And so then you have uh, these two streams. The total length of stream would be maybe five kilometres. These streams are a metre wide, 10 centimetres deep. They're tiny little streams. And so then you start to look at, well, what's impacting those tiny little relic habitats that are there? And that's where feral horses, I call them, come in. And so you have uh, this tiny little refuge that you're trying to protect. And so you deal with all of the threats. It's not pick the worst, you deal with them all because you can't afford to have anything impacting those species. And that's where brumbies come in, basically. Wow. Anyway, so that's it. They widen streams, they cross streams, they blow out the width, they cause them to become shallow, they get put sediment in, they destroy the vegetation. And so all those things add stress to a fish that is already critically endangered. That's that's the last bloody rung on the on the ladder before going. So extinct. they're not, you know, they're, they're not the one that are doing all the damage in the first place. But nope. when the damage has been done, they they're kind of giving them an uppercut when they're already winded. That's type it. Thing. Yeah, they're kicking them when they're down. That's yep. it. You know, and See so how many analogies we can give. It. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I mean, you know, fish have have dealt with you know animals in their habitats. That's fine. But you know, in in the horse case at the moment, um, there's 20,000 horses in yep. Kosciuszko National Park and that's just not sustainable with some of the threatened species that are there. And again, you, you're exactly back to the same situation of you have one-eyed supporters of horses mm-hmm. and you have one-eyed supporters of fish. Yep. And I'm the latter. So you, you slipped in a little reference just before you got onto that, which was... Uh... I think you tried to say it under your breath. You did find one or you discovered one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've always been interested in anyone that I get the chance to interview in this field, those penny dropping moments where, you, you know, you, you discovered something, you found something, you, you realised that uh, whatever you're searching on, it, it's when it all happens, you know what I mean? I'm going to assume that this you stumbled on this by mistake, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me a little bit about your, your discovery. Oh, so I absolutely stumbled on it by mistake and I didn't know that I'd even stumbled on it, okay? And so I was up there doing uh, some work trying to look at um, high country crayfish and how they had fared in the fires, so the spiny crayfish. So everyone will be aware of the big Murray crayfish, mm-hmm. okay? Well, these are their, their little upcountry um, relatives. And so when I was sampling for crayfish every now and then, you catch some galaxias. They all look the same, you know, they're tiny little things. And so I'd uh, throw a couple in a jar because I knew uh, a friend of mine was doing some genetic studies on them. And I thought I was contributing to a a study on the genetic diversity in mountain galaxias. And he rang me up and said, I got the genetics results back. What do you reckon I found? And I said, I got no bloody idea. And he said, come on, have a guess. And I said, look, I have no idea. Just cut to the point. Tell me. (laughs) And he said... We found another population of stocky galaxias. Well, you could have picked me up off the floor. I thought, really? You know, so yeah, um, right. yeah. So then I went back again and I caught some fish to get some more to study and uh, went back to this guy and uh, he said, ah, you got two species of galaxias in there. And I thought, bugger me, you know. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years and I'm looking at these things and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they're slightly different, I suppose. And now I've got my eye in and I can see. So stocky galaxias occurs at this new site with mountain galaxias and that has never been found before. And that changes how we want to try and conserve them because we thought that it only occurred on its own and so you would never uh, put stocky galaxias in with another galaxia species because it might hybridise and then you've lost it. Okay? Yeah. And now we know that stocky galaxias and mountain galaxias can co-occur together and you go, well, that opens up a whole new raft of areas where you can reintroduce these species if you want to. Mm-hmm. You know? 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, that was a, so this, an interesting this, moment. This idea, like you, you, at the start of the podcast, you said in '72 we rediscovered, or we we discovered the trout cod. Well, you know what what year did your discovery happen? Uh, well, I found the second population in 2020. Right? There you go. So. So at the time when you said that, I was like, well, that's ridiculous, but you're still doing it now and there's chances are we're still going to be doing it again in the future when there's still one third of the species that we haven't actually named. So, you know, here's me thinking that uh, what idiots we were before 72, but really it's just that the reality is there's so many species, there's only so much research going in and until, like you said, we direct enough funds and resources to it, we're going to be discovering things all the time. That's exactly right. And and for things like, you know, birds and mammals in Australia, it's pretty unusual to find a new species because mm-hmm. they have received so much attention over the years because they're gaudy and coloured yep. and people are fascinated by them. For things that occur in tiny little streams up in the backcountry, no one's really looking. You know, they're up there either fishing for trout mm. and so they realise there's no trout there so they go somewhere else or they're just not paying attention. Yep. And in reality, a whole lot of these things are down to whether you are a lumper or a splitter. And so that's in taxonomic terms, whether you like to group things together and say that's one species with a whole lot of different colour forms in it or whether you're a splitter, which is what John Gould was, okay? Every bird that had a different coloured bum, he'd describe it as a new species, you know? And so then eventually they all got sunk and so they were lumped together and now we're in the stage of splitting things mm. out because we realise with the new tools that we have about you know looking at genetics and things, and we can see that these two groups of animals never interbreed. So therefore, they must be species, we right. think. Okay? That's a good way of doing it. If they're yeah. not interbreeding, then if they're... If they're not they're... interbreeding or they only interbreed very rarely or they have you know quite distinct you know genetic structures, then yep. you say, well, they're probably different species. And then once you've got that genetic signature, then you look really hard at the fish you've got and you mm. go, oh, yeah, that one's got three fin rays instead of four fin rays or something. Oh, yeah, that one, the patterning. So stocky galaxies, the patterning goes all the way onto the head, onto the jaw. Mm. In mountain galaxies, it doesn't. And so you start to pick up these subtle differences and then you can start to do more work on them. Right. And I'm not a taxonomist, okay? I'm, yep. a, I'm a guy that likes to go out in the field and catch fish. That's that's my job. I just get great pleasure out of that. I always have. So you are you, are you electrofishing? Or netting or just all of the above? like uh, Depends on the species um, that you're targeting. Mm. So for um, small mountain streams, you're electrofishing. Mm. You know, you catch fish, you look at them, you identify them, you count them, you measure them, you let them go or whatever. Um, if you're working in big rivers, um, then you can use electrofishing boats. And so they're sort of uh, pretty effective for some species but not for others or not for li- uh, different life forms. So electrofishing catches big fish better than it catches little fish. And so if you're interested to see whether things are breeding, then if you're trying to catch little young of the year perch or something like that, electrofishing isn't the best way to do it. And so then you can use some nets. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you, you tailor your sampling to what you're trying to what find out. What you've got to do. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, just, I just want to round out this conversation that we've started on, on trout. Um, just qu- quickly, is there any significance of why the trout cod is called the trout cod, do you think? No. Nah. Do you think it? Do you think it was just a matter of going? Oh, it kind of looks like a trout. Let's call it. Let's call it one, but slightly pointier nose yeah, or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. You know, and so again, it goes back to that acclimatization phase. So the little native mammals, they used to call them the marsupial mouse. Okay, and so yeah. the mouse is a throwback to something that came from their home country. Okay. And really, they're an antichinus. They're not related to a mouse at all. They're just a small animal. That's just what we, what we know. That's just what we call them, yeah. And so common names really mean mm. very little. So the trout to you is, you know, uh, I guess to round that out, a statement from you, a trout is, mm. is it on par with uh, the damage that the carp is doing, but just for different species? Well, it's in dif- a different species and different habitats. So, you know, think of trout as foxes of the rivers. Yeah. Okay. And so they're a predator. That's what they're built to do. That's what they will do. Um, um, and in some areas, the, the damage has been done mm. and you're not going to get those small species back. Redfin yep. perch are the same. Carp are a lot more subtle, so they're not a predator. It's always easy to say, you know, you look at a tiger, you know, with blood dripping from its fangs and you go, gee, that's pretty nasty looking animal. Mm. But carp... 
carp aren't fish predators, okay? No, so they course. change the environment a little more subtly. They lock up the carbon, they uproot plants, they make the water more turbid, they introduce parasites, so they've got parasites that now spill over onto native fish, things like that. So it's quite hard to pick some of these subtle differences, you know? I find that interesting. That's, that's a good way to put it. Carp don't, you know, trout eat fish. That's it. That's the issue. They're out competing them. They're, they're, they're eating it. But the carp don't eat fish. They just change the environment in which the fish are living in. That's right. And they make the environment not, you know, less suitable for that, native fish. And I think that's probably why, in this, you know, in our Australian story, if you call it that, they're probably excused a little bit, the trout, because mainstream media or, you know, it's not as, it's not as documented um, at, at the effects, like you could go to a river and it's all muddy and turbid and eroding banks and you know roots sticking out and whatnot, and you go, well, that's the carp, you know. But you go to a beautiful stream, you know, crystal clear water, rocky habitats. Oh, well, that's where the the trout lives. You know, he's not doing any damage, but they don't see what goes on. And and it's about carp are seen to have no value in Australia. Can't you, eat them. Can't catch well, them. You, you can't, you catch can't them. eat them. Yeah. They're hard to fill. It. Yeah. They taste all right <laughs> Have if you, you smoke one? them. Yeah, I've eaten carp several times. Um, and so trout come with all of this historical baggage. You know, they were the squires fish. Mm. They're the classy fish, you mm. know, and they're good to eat, okay, and they're fun to catch because they fight, you know. And so carp, you know, they will fight, but they're not, you know, they're muddy mm. taste and they're hard to fill it. And so because they have no redeeming feature, they're vilified. Now, I'm not a carp apologist at all, okay? Mm. I think carp are a major problem. They're 80% of the biomass in our rivers. So they're obviously, they're competing for food and space. They're just not eating native fish. Yep. Um, and so when you have a competing narrative, horses is the same. You know, the noble steed that carried our soldiers to battle, you know. Um, when they have a, a, a value system that goes with it, that's when the conflicts between those value systems become really hard to manage. Yep. Whereas carp, nobody loves carp. Except yep. for Europeans. In Europe, they're the, the biggest farm fish you can get. Aren't they the most eaten fish in the world? Too? Yeah. Something like you know, that. I mean, in, in Europe, a, a forista, you would go and catch a carp, you put it in your bathtub to purge it, you put it in clean mm. water, and then you have a big feast, you know. In Australia, you yeah. chuck it up the bank. Yeah, <laughs> quite literally. Yeah, you're directed to do that. So um, so the story of the trout cod, uh, the story of the stocky galaxius, sounds like you've spent a lot of time not only – you know, discovering them and whatnot, but figuring out what we can do for them. Um, what are the what are the big things? What are the big ticket items when it comes to, to conservation, or even just helping these species that we need to be focusing on in the next, let's say, five ten years? Where where is it? Is it riparian veg? You know, is it is it you know basic carp viruses or you know uh, controlling tr uh, trout? What are the big ones that we need to be focusing on to make sure that these species have the best chance at survival? So most of these species are really suffering from a reduction in either the quantity or the quality of their habitat. So we've got to look after their habitat. Stocky galaxias have got almost no habitat left, okay, because they're pushed to the very limits of their distribution. So what we have to do for them is try and establish more populations so that when one winks out, and they will, so Stocky Galaxius in 2020, the fire went into the catchment, I went and did a rescue, we thought they were done. And just by chance, the catchment didn't burn very severely and they persisted there. So with things that are in really small distributions, you've got to do everything you can to look after their habitat and build up the number of populations. For things that are in the you know lowland rivers or are more broadly distributed and have severely reduced abundance, then you really are looking at improving the habitat quality there and addressing the threats. We need to provide fish passage. We need to provide more trees along the rivers. We need to provide water. So water is being stolen from rivers for a whole raft of purposes, domestic water supply, agriculture, you name it. And so we need to balance up these things and at the moment, the dollar rules. So if you have a conflict between, uh, uh, say, farming that generates food and, and dollars for someone and fish, then fish lose out. And we just need to be smarter at how we do that, basically. Yep. So, yep. yeah, habitat, dealing with introduced species, be they horses, trout, carp, rabbits, whatever. And, uh, yeah. On just, the habitat one, is there an ideal habitat for... You know, is it true? Is it? Have I read this somewhere that trout cod love rocky habitats? 
Well, they generally are found in these more rocky upland streams. Yeah. Now, whether that is a true representative of their uh, representation of their habitat or whether that's where they've just managed to hang on, mm. um, I don't know. But, yes, they like rock. They like upland habitats. They like slightly faster water. Yep. Um, they probably would do best in those habitats. So focus on those areas. Make sure the habitat's there. If it's not, do do what we can to create that. I know Ozfish, for example, are dropping rocky habitats in areas which, you know, like you said, we're not sure if that's just coincidence or it helps, but look, it's, it's doing something. Oh, absolutely. It, it all provides structure and cover yep. for fish, you know. So the, the last sort of remaining natural population of trout cod is in the Murray River at Yarralonga. Now, that is not an upland rocky stream. Mm. That is a lowland, slow, mm. turbid stream that's full of snags. So timber takes the place of yep. rock, you know. So fish are pretty Catholic in this way. They can... They just want cover. They want somewhere to hide, yep. somewhere to, to feed. They're a simple you know, species. So, some, yeah. Somewhere to spawn. You know, it's not it's not rocket science, really. Yeah. Is there a, a certain area of, you know, you do a lot of travel, right, around Australia or you have done in your, your career. Yep. I think a lot of the conversation at the moment is how bad some places are, right? Mm-hmm. So how, how poor of habitats here, how poor the water quality is, how poor the fishing is. I'm still... Confident, there's a few gems around. You know, there's still those few areas of river or a few streams, few systems, whatever you want to call them, that have, you know, pretty they're they're pretty close to what they were a while ago, right? They haven't maybe a bit low population, maybe it's because they're the national park, whatever it may be. Is there a couple that you've come across where you go, well, this is beautiful, this is good, we need more of this? You know, where where are some? So yeah. so I've I've spent you know thirty years of my life in the Upper Murrumbidgee River, mm-hmm. okay. And so I, I tend to work from sort of Canberra up to the headwaters and it's beautiful, gorgy country. It's not necessarily in National Park, but it's large land holdings. Because it's hard country, rocky, mountainous country, it's not flogged out. It's not fantastic grazing land. And so, you know, people graze part of it and they just leave the rest of it because it's such hard country. And to me, that hard country is magnificent, Mm -hmm. you know. And you go to the Kimberley, you know, it's hard country. Mm. You go to the deserts, it's hard country. But gosh, you know, everything has its own place and it tugs at the heartstrings. And, And you just... You walk out into stuff like that and you can just sit down and you can tune out the rest of the world and that's great. And know. is the water quality reflected in that? In the fact that it might not be flogged out as much as some other areas? Is it, is it good fishing there? Is it good? Is everything in good nick? There's habitat there? There's, you know, or is it, it needs work too? Oh, all, just about everywhere needs a bit of work. Yep. And, and the, the key message is really to protect the good bits you have and, and so there's an old saying in uh, river restoration, don't raise the Titanic. So you don't look for the very worst, hardest problem that you can find and try and fix it. Let's, let's pick some of the low-hanging fruit. Let's deal with some of the things that we can deal with, prove that we can do it, get some understanding of how it works, and then you start to gradually apply that to some other sections. That's brilliant. Anyway. Don't raise the Titanic. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. classic. That is very good. So you think sometimes maybe we're trying to do the, the big stuff, the one that the one that takes time, takes money, and it takes energy, and we're losing focus on some of the stuff that we could probably fix in a shorter period of time. Yeah, so really, I mean, you need to do a mix of both things, mm. you know. You need to pick up some hard problems. If you ignore all the hard problems, then everything's just going to get worse. Yep. But don't put all your energy into the hard mm. stuff, you know. Bring people on board, bring landholders on board, bring wreck anglers on board. They can see that they're making a difference and then everyone feels better and you keep going. Very good. Well, that's been a, a very, a very good conversation. I always like to give yourself or anyone in that position, in that chair, a bit of a, a, bit of a call to arms. You know, percent someone who's listening to this um, that might want to get involved in either some of the things you've spoken about, they want to learn more about some of the things you've spoken about, um, you know, what, what, what do you encourage them to do? Is it read more? Is it watch more? Is it, you know, is it read the book? Is it get out there and, and you know, go see it for yourself? Go see some of these rivers firsthand. What, what do you want to say to someone who's really excited about what you've said today? So, yeah, go out and appreciate the wild environments that are there. Yeah. Open your eyes. Don't have your blinkers on. See what the problems are. Mm. And then there are plenty of groups out there that want to do things, be they angling groups, be they national parks groups, be they land care groups, you know. Mm-hmm. And every little thing that you do can make a difference. I pick up rubbish when I'm out in the bush, right? And that may seem like a really trivial thing to do. 
But everywhere I go where there isn't rubbish, I think, ah, oh, shit, this is pretty good, mm. isn't it? You know? And wherever I go where it's full of rubbish, you go, oh, bloody mongrels, you know, why don't they understand what it could be like? Yep. Same deal. L- little things, you know, little things, basically. Don't raise the Titanic. <laughs> That's exactly That's right. That's a quote to come out of it. Thanks so much for your time, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Good on you. This episode of Ozcast is proudly supported by BCF, Boating Camp and Fishing, and the One Basin CRC.